problem in China is that we don't actually know how bad the non-performing loan situation is. So the official non-performing loan ratio is, is at the end of last year was 1.89%. So that means for every $100 worth of loans that the banks have, have made, about $1.89 of those are, are bad. Now, that figure absolutely defies credulity. Nobody believes that's what the actual figure is. I mean, the United States' non-performing loan figure is 1.1%. Is uh, the Germans are 1.7% and China's is 1.89% after what is literally the longest running and the biggest expansion of debt really in modern history. So th the question is really then how bad is the debt problem? And it's a complete black box. That was Denny McMahon. And this is the Brendan Carr Podcast. Today, my guest is Denny McMahon. Denny is the author of China's Great Wall of Debt, Shadow Banks, Ghost Cities, Massive Loans, and the End of of the Chinese miracle. Denny covered the Chinese economy for the Wall Street Journal for several years. He's a native to Australia, but he's a fluent speaker of Mandarin Chinese. So he has this incredible perspective on the Chinese economy. In today's episode, Denny shares why China appears strong despite tremendous risk to the Chinese economy. He explains all the nuances of how to invest around the Chinese economy, which I found personally very, very interesting. And he tells us what updates we should be aware of to the Chinese economy already this year. All that and more. Let's go to the show. The first thing that I'm I'm curious about is is your understanding of Mandarin. How how did that come to be? <laughs> um, I had my first um, Chinese lesson when I was nine years old, um, and uh, that was my dad's influence because my father at the time was uh, he was a mining engineer. Uh, he spent most of his career working for Rio Tinto, um, and about that time he was traveling a lot internationally. And he says that at that time he was coming across more and more Chinese officials representing sort of Chinese, um, I guess, trading houses. Uh, turning up all over the world in the various places, the various mines that, that he was visiting and, and, and he was working with. And so I remember him coming home one day and sort of saying that he found it embarrassing that uh, most Australians, by, by which he met sort of Anglo-Irish, you know, Australians like ourselves, um, typically only spoke one language. And he decided mm. I was going to learn an Asian language um, and that plenty of people already spoke Japanese because this was in the late 1980s um, and that I was going to learn Chinese. And that kind of set me on on a particular course because I, I studied through high school. I, I studied at university. I spent a year in China after I after I finished high school and then went back again halfway through my degree. Um, and when I finally started um, started working, I started work as a as a journalist in Shanghai and then Beijing. Yeah, and and you understanding the language, then it it seems that that's been a real advantage for you. And and it would seem from the outside looking in that with with economics and numbers that if someone could just read the numbers that they could make sense of the Chinese economy. But it, it seems for you, language has been um, a game changer. Really, how how have you used your your native your your language skills to to get a better handle on the Chinese economy. No, absolutely. Look, I couldn't have done the work that I've done without being able to speak Chinese. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. So I think as a financial journalist, you kind of straddle this world in between, I guess, a, a financial sort of a, an analyst um, and I guess a storyteller. So on one hand, you've kind of got to, got to go out to the countryside and to other cities and, and talk to people and really get a sense of what their experiences are, because that is really the most important way to be able to interpret data. Because half the time, sure, you know, the government puts out numbers or whatever organization puts out numbers, but there is always, you can never take the numbers at face value. There's always a story behind them and you'll never completely understand what's going on unless you're actually talking to locals. Now, of course, the other side of the equation is that so much data in China is problematic. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a truism at this point that, uh, you know, that the GDP, annual GDP numbers are, are really a fantasy. If anything, it's kind of a, and that, that annual GDP number is kind of an indication more than anything of what the, you know, the local governments need to be striving to achieve as opposed to any sort of real reflection of how fast the, the economy is growing. So you kind of always are sort of looking out for new sets of numbers that can reflect what's really going on. So I've spent a lot of time sort of wading through Chinese bond prospectuses and, and local government websites, um, credit rating reports, just looking for numbers that 
perhaps don't get as much scrutiny as official data does, and so perhaps is a little bit more reliable, particularly if you can then um, cross-reference that against other things you're hearing and, and other numbers you're seeing elsewhere. Yeah, you had you had fascinating stories in the book, too, of other journalists or people with a journalistic bent who were doing things like watching factories and seeing how much movement was actually coming in and out of the factory to get a sense of, of what was really going on there. Were there any things like that, that that helped you to specifically get to the root of something? You know, being a journalist, we typically don't have the sort of resources to be, to be able to mobilize those sorts of you know, that sort of technology or even to dedicate the manpower to sit outside of factories and whatnot. Although I was always fascinated. Usually the sort of people doing that sort of work were um, American short sellers. So oh, they, yeah, yeah they, were going, they were looking at Chinese companies listed on US um, stock exchanges and didn't believe the uh, disclosures of those companies and so kind of came up with their, their own creative ways of, of vetting exactly what these companies were saying. Um, as for me, I mean, you know, typically I, I'd never really had the sort of the, the time or the resources to, to do that sort of stuff. Although I did find, I mean, particularly the, the time that I spent trying to understand uh, the phenomenon of ghost cities. Um, I, I made, I think, four trips out to the, the same ghost city out in um, northeast China in Liaoning province. And just sort of being there and going back time and time again, meeting the same people um, and just trying to talk to people and get their, their stories really managed to build this sort of rich tapestry of what was going on. And you take their stories and then kind of try and cross-reference it with whatever other resources you can find online. Uh, that ultimately was was the way that I sort of pieced together um, some of the, the, I guess, the best stories I, I, I wrote. Yeah. And w what is a ghost city for those who don't know? Because I certainly didn't before I read the book. <laughs> right. So it is... Um, Chinese ghost cities kind of take the, the concept of how we understand a ghost city in, uh, in the West, I guess, and, and turn it on its head. So in the United States, you have like the West, the, you know, the Western states are kind of you know, riddled with ghost cities, which are typically towns that sprung up overnight because of some sort of resources boom, like a, like a, you know, a gold rush or a silver rush or something like that. And then when the resources ran out, those towns just as quickly hollowed out. So they were, you know, they, they built up very quickly and then the population left, leaving all the various infrastructure in its place when there was no real economic reason for that town to exist anymore. And so Chinese ghost cities turn that idea on its head. I mean, firstly, we're talk, talking about an order of magnitude significantly bigger than a Californian ghost town. I mean, they, these are genuine cities with, um, you know, public swimming pools and traffic lights and four lane highways and a whole lot of government buildings and ornamental lakes and everything you would imagine of, of sort of a modern city. Um, but these things were built from scratch in the expectation that eventually the population would move in. Um, and the rationale in large part was it was tied to this idea of China's population rapidly urbanizing. And that's kind of been a major trend over the last 40 years. Uh, there has been this flow of population from the countryside uh, into the major cities. But this ghost city phenomenon was kind of taking that idea a little bit too far because that population flow, it typically follows the jobs. Now, building a, a, a city from scratch, you know, you don't have anything that really ensures that a population is going to turn up when you finish it. You then need to be able to build a thriving economy around it. And the way you usually try and do that is with manufacturing jobs and, and whatnot. And so a, lot, a, a large number of these cities that are built from scratch never manage to attract more than a very small population. And, and you've got to remember that these cities aren't entirely empty. And I know the expression ghost city kind of suggests that you could turn up to one of them and it'll, it'll be nothing but you and the tumbleweed. Right. But China has got uh, you know, these local governments that set these things up. Um, that they have all sorts of ways to get kind of a, a skeletal population to move in. So typically, you know, you will have you know, the, the, the government of the original city will build a ghost city 20 minutes ride down the track, down the, the drive down the road, and it will move all its government offices in there. And so all of a sudden during the day, you'll have all these um, government workers there because that's where their new office buildings are. And they'll be given subsidies to buy apartments in that city. And a lot of them will, but they'll also keep their old apartments in the old city and commute home every day. 
or you'll have this phenomenon where a lot of um, the, the high schools or the primary schools, the elementary schools, even in the old city and the surrounding country areas, they'll be closed down and all those students will be bussed into the new schools that have opened up in the new city. And so you kind of do have this sort of very, uh, this, this small kernel of population which kind of seeds these ghost cities. But it, it's nothing more than, uh, you know, a, a, I guess a skeleton staff is the best way to, to think of it, mm. unless you can kind of build a, a manufacturing or industrial base or, or around it. And some cities have managed to do that. I mean, one of the classic examples is uh, a place uh, called Zhongdong, which is was a ghost city attached to Zhengzhou, which is a big city in um, Henan province. Um, and 60 Minutes did a story about there, uh, there in, I think, maybe 2013, showing that it was a ghost city. But very soon after that, it managed to fill up because the city officials managed to convince Foxconn, which builds... Um, like literally hundreds of thousands of of iPhones every year, it managed to convince um, Foxconn to set set up a factory there, and so that managed to ensure that you know you had a certain uh, base manufacturing industry uh, that moved in, and that implied a whole lot of other workers, and that then created a whole lot of economic activity around it. But then a lot of these ghost cities are in smaller cities that don't have the same pulling power as somewhere like somewhere like Zhengzhou and, and Zhengdong, and so they remain relatively empty, except for the bureaucrats and for the school children, because there just hasn't been a real pull to be able to attract. Uh, the the population that the cities need. Yeah. So with a lot of these situations, it's it's something that would take a, a big a, amount of debt to make happen. But there's there's sort of a hope. There's sort of a runway toward the the project lifting off when things come together. Do you see China as as perhaps having a runway at some point? There is there is a lift off where they will come out of this, or or what do you see ahead? I think there's kind of two parts to this equation, right? So one is how do they deal with the explicit explicit debt problem as it stands? You know, you've got non-performing loans in the in the financial system. How do you deal with them? And then the other side of this question, and it's related, is what do you do about the way that China the way the Chinese economy grows? Hmm. So China grows. Oh, its traditional economic growth model has been um, through debt-led investment. So if you drive around the Chinese countryside, you see pretty much everything that's kind of been built from this decade long debt binge that got rolling pretty much in, at the end of 2008 in response to the global financial crisis. I mean, you drive around and you see the ghost cities, you see underutilized infrastructure, you can see the factories that are operating at a, at a fraction of their capacity. And all of these things were, were, were built with debt. And so, that's been great for economic growth because it allowed during the boom years, it allowed China to grow at 10, 11, 12 percent every year. But that's unsustainable because if you can keep building this stuff, then ultimately you're never going to be able to pay back the debt. So what we're seeing at the moment is that growth rates are, are slowing. Um, growth is currently at about 6.5 percent annually a year. And that's slowing so much in part because the government has forced the financial system to rein in the pace of lending. So less debt less lending directly translates into a slower pace of, of economic growth. So what China really needs at the moment is a new model of growth. It needs a way that it can grow with less debt. Um, and it has a few ideas about that, and we can get onto that a little bit later. So that's kind of one thing, that ultimately to fix its problem, China needs to come up with a new way to grow, effectively a low debt way that it continue to sort of generate politically acceptable uh, pace of growth. Now, the other side of the equation is how does it deal with all those non-performing loans in the system at the moment? Because they can have a real drag on growth. Um, you know, particularly, you know, the, as debt builds up, it becomes more difficult for companies to, to service those loans, which then create all sorts of difficulties for the banks. The problem in China is that we don't actually know how bad the non-performing loan situation is. So the official non-performing loan ratio is at the end of last year was 1.89%. So that means for every $100 worth of loans that the banks have, have made, about $1.89 of those are, are bad. Now, that figure absolutely defies credulity. Nobody believes that's what the actual mm -hmm. figure is. I mean, the United States' non-performing loan figure is 1.1%. Is 
Um, the Germans are 1.7% and China's is 1.89% after what is literally the longest running and the biggest expansion of debt really in modern history. So <laughs> the, the question is really then how bad is the debt problem? And it's a complete black box. And part of the reason is because a lot of those bad loans have been hidden in the shadow banking system. And so it's, they're not, you know, they're sort of loans disguised as something else. And so it's very difficult to, to get a feed on, get a feel for just how bad things are. Now, at the moment, the government is in a sort of a, a full flight, a fully fledged attempt to kind of rein in risk in the financial system. They're pushing banks to dispose of their bad loans more aggressively. Um, they're forced to contraction of shadow banking starting from about a year ago. Um, they're, they're, they've really put a lot of pressure on the banks to rein in some of their more uh, creative financial practices to make the system less risky than it used to be. And all of that sort of bodes well for the stability of the financial system. But we're still left with this question of like, how sustainable is that process? How costly is it going to be when we really don't have a read on how bad the the the, 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 the sort of the quality of, of the loans actually are? Ultimately, what it's really going to come down to is, um, you know, is whether, uh, well, I, I guess at the moment what we could expect is if nothing changes, if they just keep trying to clean up the financial system, that growth will get slower and slower as the pace of credit expansion gets slower as well. But in China, the pace of economic growth isn't just a reflection of how strong the economy is. There's a whole lot of political considerations tied up in that as well. Um, the reason China has grown as quickly as it has for so long is that there really is at any given time a almost sort of a, a minimum a minimum acceptable politically acceptable pace of, of growth what that level is at any given time is sort of hard to put your finger on and certainly um, you know the, the political consensus in China at the moment is that they're willing to accept slower growth than was the case a few years ago mm -hmm. but there must come a point in the not so distant future where the pace of growth is just too slow. So at the moment, it's about six and a half percent. The authorities are targeting somewhere between six and six and a half percent growth in 2019. But what if the economy grows to five percent or four percent or even three percent? You get down to three percent and it's growing pretty much as fast as the United States. Uh, at what point does it cease to be politically sustainable? And, and so then do you get a situation where the authorities sort of slip back into their old ways, which is, OK, let's just ramp up the system again, revert to sort of old style stimulus, which is you just push the banks and the shadow banks to lenders as much as they can without really worrying about the quality of those loans. And once you allow that to happen again, you end up with a lot more bad loans. You end up with a lot of um, more risk in the financial system. And again, you start looking down the barrel of potential you know, crises and sort of the unsustainability of debt and whatnot. So that is one potential outcome, but it's clearly the one that the authorities want to avoid. Instead, they want to sort of transition the economy into a different mode of economic growth. Um, and what they want is, what, the way they want to do that is to kind of force march the economy up the value added chain um, into, you know, so that Chinese industries start producing more semiconductors and robotics and electric vehicles. Mm. And of course, that has problems in and of itself because that sort of a transition it's trying to achieve puts it sort of headlong into conflict with the United States. Right, right. So that makes for more competition. Now, you, you mentioned a politically driven amount of growth. What, what, is, what is the political agenda there? Is that avoiding the middle income trap? Is that becoming the, the world's premier power? What is, what is the driver there? It's, it's a whole lot of things. It, it's, at any given time, it's not, it's not ever one. And those motivations change a little bit over time. Yes. So about a decade ago, when we had a different set of leaders, Hu Jintao was president, Wen Jiabao was premier, you had an expression which was bao, bao ba, to maintain eight. And so there was this uh, political uh, sort of, a, sort of a imperative that the economy must maintain a minimum annual growth of 8%. Now, what was driving that at the time as much as anything was the need to maintain sufficient um, employment. So there was a concern that you know, we China had gone through this whole wave of economic reform, um, and that you know you'd uh, uh, 
reformed a whole lot of state-owned enterprises, a lot of people had been thrown out of work, you had a lot young population that was coming into the workforce. To be able to maintain uh, the, the, a minimum amount of job creation that was necessary to ensure social stability, there was this sense that China needed a minimum of 8% annual growth every year. Now, at the moment, it's a very different um, equation. Now, over the last six months or so, yeah, we've started to hear a lot more from the senior leaders about the need to uh, provide jobs and to defend against unemployment, which is something we haven't heard for a very long time. But in some ways, the focus on unemployment this time around is different from 10 or 15 years ago. I think there's less concern about factory workers um, and there's a lot more concern about university graduates because China's um, universities are churning out more and more uh, graduates every year, but the jobs aren't there commensurate with the graduates' expectations of what uh, you know, of what they are entitled to upon graduating with a university degree. Degree, and so there's there's that sort of that sort of pressure at the moment. So yeah, there's one level. Yeah, you know the need for growth is for employment, but for other reasons, you also have things like uh, you know achieving the China dream um, that. Uh, the, the 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 grand overarching agenda of of this particular you know set of leaders in in China at the moment is to kind of restore ch uh, China to its rightful place in the global order, and to be able to do that really does require a certain pace of of economic growth, partly so that it can lift the lifestyles of of Chinese people, so that they can enter into the 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 China can enter into the ranks of rich nations. In, in a feasible period, but it also requires fast growth in, so that China actually has the resources to be able to behave like a, a strong, powerful nation internationally as well. Um, and of course, you also mentioned the issue of, of the middle income gap, uh, the, the income, pardon me, middle income trap. There is sort of this concern. So just to sort of back up and talk briefly about what the middle income trap is, this was an idea that was developed by the World Bank, I think it was uh, in 2008. And what they did is they looked at 101 countries that could be fairly be uh, defined as being middle income. That is, they weren't rich nations and they weren't sort of genuinely poor developing nations. Um, 101 countries that were middle income in 1960 and then looked at how many of those had transitioned out of being middle income and actually became rich nations like OECD nations by I think it was 2008 and found that in that uh, only 13 nations managed to make that transition. Now over that period a lot of developing countries came very close. I mean certainly during the 1990s there was a sense that Thailand and Malaysia um, you know, were kind of on track, you know, these tiger economies were on track to uh, become rich nations within a matter of a few years or a decade. And then they hit, then they hit the, the Asian financial crisis. And since then, there certainly hasn't been any talk of those countries making the transition. Same thing goes for Argentina and, and Mexico at various times as well. They were on track to make the transition. And then ultimately, they hit the middle income trap. And I think that more than anything is sort of what keeps the officials in Beijing up at night. And so there is this sense that China has to really kind of grow. You know, they are at that moment in terms of income levels at the moment where most nations actually uh, sort of uh, fall over and don't make the transition. And so there's this sense that they need to continue to, to maintain a fast pace of growth now so that they can make that transition. Now, of course, that's all sort of tied up with an understanding that the way that the economy grows at the moment, this debt-led investment-focused model of growth isn't the way to get through the middle income trap. They realise that they, you know, that to become a rich nation, the economy needs to grow more differently, and that's to have a much bigger focus on on uh, more technologically advanced industries. Um, but still, the core of the issue here is a recognition that the economy needs to continue to grow fast to be able to make this transition that most nations haven't been able to do. Yeah, and you, you say to become a rich nation. I think I think there are a lot of folks who would already see China or perceive China as a rich nation. We I think in the States, a lot of people think that China is surpassing us as, as the world economic leader. People have this perception. Why do you think that the Chinese economy appears so strong? I think it's partly because the Chinese export machine has been mm. so strong that we actually feel the presence 
of China in our in our lives more palpably than many other uh, economies. So I, I think you know China looms large globally um, because of it, it. It's been having this incrementally larger and larger impact on the global economy. So we over the years we've bought more and more from China. Over the years there has been you know there has been a genuine migration of jobs from the United States to China. Um, increasingly, when we see footage of China or people go to visit China, they visit places like Beijing and Shanghai, these you know incredibly modern cities full of skyscrapers. Well, Shanghai in particular, yeah. full of skyscrapers full of of steel and and glass. Um, and so when you see these cities, they feel like rich nations. Um, but the problem is that Beijing and Shanghai only represent a small part of China, and it doesn't really take much. To get beyond the major cities to sort of see the other side of the equation and sort of the extreme poverty in the countryside. And to be honest, it's not just poverty in the countryside. I mean, China literally has hundreds of cities, and many of the, most of those cities are still genuinely poor. Even in a place like Beijing, um, you know, there is such a, a severe housing shortage that you do have people living in slums inside the city. You have construction workers who live in tents on the construction sites. You have people who live, you know, we don't have an exact number. I've heard any, anywhere up to a million people, but let's say hundreds of thousands of people literally living underground in China in like windowless basements and, you know, uh, electrical cabinets and car parks because, you know, they just can't afford the, the housing elsewhere, which is incredible in a place like Beijing because on one hand you have people living like that and then you kind of emerge from your bunker underground and you see Maseratis and Lamborghinis on the city streets. Mm. So there is an incredible income inequality in China, which is which is far worse than any major de- developed economy and, and perhaps most, and I think in, in some ways most uh, de- you know, large developing economies as well. And so I think it's easy for the rest of the world to kind of see a China in the ascendance because it has these you know, cities that on first glance look incredibly rich because it has been uh, a, a t- a accounting for a, a larger and larger share of global international activity because it is starting to develop large, um, co- you know, globally expansive company, uh, companies that uh, have a recognisable um, presence around the world. And then because of things like, you know, Chinese soccer clubs buying up um, um, you know, top-ranked international soccer players, um, or you know, a few years back, Chinese entrepreneurs kind of cornering cornering the market for high-end French wine because there is this real pr- economic presence that is being felt that is being extended by the Chinese elite globally, and so I think that's what we register. What we don't register because we really don't see is the extreme inequality in China, and that the the life of the average Chinese person is 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 far less well off than sort of the snapshot that I think is sort of trickled out into the rest of the world. Yeah, and when you put it like that, it becomes it becomes much clearer. I was sort of um, strangely fortunate in that I, I told you before we started this interview that um, that my neighborhood was affected by the wildfires in Southern California. But that was also an opportunity for me to get out and do some travel. And when I left the country, I was shocked at the constant presence of China. Like I was in your your native country, Australia, and I was in Sydney, and I I could have been in a Chinese city. It felt like everywhere I went, there were Chinese people. There was a <laughs> vibrant China, uh, Chinatown neighborhood. I saw Chinese people buying lots of high-end sneakers. There seemed to yeah. be just this this spending and this presence of Chinese people everywhere. And then I, I was also in Sri Lanka. And something you pointed out in your book is there's a, there's a Chinese factory on the Sri Lankan 100 rupee note. I'm, I've got it right in front of me. It's this, <laughs> oh, it's really? this, yeah, it's this beautiful it. orange piece of paper. It's got butterflies and birds. And then in the center, there's this, this coal power plant with a waterfall behind it. And that's Sri Lankan money. And, and so it, it, it came up in your book, this, this factory. And I looked at the money and sure enough, there it was. So yes, there there's this world presence that the Chinese have now, and it becomes so visible when you stop and you think about it. But you're saying that that is not indicative of the strength that we might perceive. There's there's sort of a, a chink in the armor. Hey, look, absolutely. I mean, that presence has been incredibly important for the global economy. Um, and so, I mean, you're talking about your experience in Australia. Two of Australia's five... Uh, biggest industries are uh, tourism and education. 
And they are so big in large part because education, because of the number of Chinese students that are studying at Australian universities and to a lesser extent, Australian high schools and tourism, because the Chinese travel in ever greater numbers to Australia as tourists. But not only that, is that when they're in Australia, they spend more than any other nationality. Yeah. And But the thing is, what we get to see is that percentage of the Chinese population with a passport and is travelling overseas. And they seem like massive numbers because the Chinese population is so big. I mean, it's 1.3, 1.4 billion people. And so we see these huge numbers of students and and tourists, and we see them having such a, a, a significant impact on our economies, and we sort of extrapolate that out to kind of our perceptions of what China must be like. But what we're really only getting is a, as a, as a look and a taste of the elite. Um, and as I said, I mean, inequality in China is as bad as anywhere in the world. Um, and particularly when you get to smaller cities, you get out to the suburbs of the big cities, particularly when you get out to the countryside, it is I mean, sort of the, the, the poverty in some places, but also clearly the, the lack of opportunity um, for people who are in some parts of the country who will you know, get to see the skyscrapers of Shanghai on television, but their lifestyle will never in any way come close to even touching that sort of particularly rarefied version of modern China. Yeah, this, this perception issue is, is really big. And I, I used to be in the United States Navy. I, I just got out a few months ago. And as, as a collective, I think a lot of folks that I would talk to in the Navy, too, also had a perception of China as being um, very, very strong in, in a military sense, in, in a business sense, too, in, in acquisitions. And they, they would tell me, like my seniors, this is not official Navy policy by any means, but people would tell me that it'll be hard to keep up with China because in the U.S., when we make an acquisition, we have to have fairness, we have to have competition, we have to have transparency before we can make a contract and in China, that they can just sort of act. And a phrase that came up in your book, too, is couldn't we just authorize the right solutions, like just be like China for a day? Do you, do you think it's really that simple? It, it really isn't. Um, it's difficult to even know where to start with that, with that particular question. Um, China certainly is very acquisitive at the moment, mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole lot of reasons for it. Um, and also sort of China is incredibly active internationally, um, sort of building infrastructure in places like Sri Lanka and, you know, Southeast Asia and Africa and in Central Asia. Um, and this is kind of in part, it's, it's part of a, a charm campaign. I mean, it is kind of the core of China's foreign policy in some ways at the moment. It, it's way of making friends and, and influencing people is to go around to the countries of the world that lack infrastructure and, um, you know, provide the, the financing and pr pr providing the know-how to get this stuff built. But at the same time, you know, China, the, the way China does a lot of these things uh, you know, is a lot is, a, is for want of a better expression, a, perhaps a, a little bit more fast and loose than sort of the strand, the standards that have been, um, you know, imposed after years of experience by countries like the United States. Um, and I don't think, and I think as much as anything, this is a process that China is currently working its way through. So in some parts of the world, uh, particularly countries that might be, you know, a, a little bit more, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, that, that do not welcome um, sort of, you know, the United States and other liberal democracies constantly, uh, you know, attaching conditions for, for aid, demanding greater transparency, better human rights standards and whatnot. They welcome Chinese investment because it doesn't come with any of those, uh, the, the, those sort of conditions are attached. Um, but at the same time, I think China is, it, it, China often finds that, you know, making those sorts of investments doesn't always work out in its in, in, in its own interests. So you sort of see this particularly in Venezuela, where China invested, literally invested tens of billions of dollars in the Chavez re regime. And there's this sort of been this realization over time that they're going to struggle to get um, at least some of that money back. Um, you know, and they even realized that while Chavez was still in power, I mean, some of that money just completely disappeared. So I think as much as anything, China is going through a, a learning period. But yeah, its standards are very different today. But I wouldn't be surprised if over time they start to converge a, a, a little bit more because they don't ultimately they're not going to want to see their, their money 
wasted over the mm. o- over the long term. Um, and you see other instances at the moment. I mean, one of the big concerns is that you've got countries that have borrowed money from China, in particular Sri Lanka, has sort of slid it into a debt trap whereby you know they couldn't repay their loans, and so the the port um, that they bought uh, that the Chinese built. Um, in Sri Lanka has kind of been signed over to a Chinese company for 99 years. I don't think that sort of debt trap diplomacy is is necessarily the core of what China is achieve is trying to um, pursue. In fact, I, I think in the long term, it's it's not in China's interest, and over time, we will see less of that sort of um, phenomena eventuating. Because I think China is is kind of going through a a, a learning period and a, a teething phase where sort of some of the stuff that is happening internationally well it's kind of china's first time around and they're trying to work out what works and and what doesn't Mm. so you talk about standards then changing for china as a nation but i wonder there are a lot of things that that play out that that are discussed in your book about how people handle things as individuals you talk about you this is something this is another gift of you being someone who can speak the language you talk about how people have kind of a different relationship with rules in china and is how they have phrases like numbers make officials so officials make numbers, or from above there is policy, so from below there are countermeasures, these these little idioms that people toss around. Do you think that if the nation as at a high level is trying to change, that individuals will also get in line? I mean, that is, that is one of the great imponderables. I think the, the reason people ba- behave like that is because the system doesn't operate in their own Interests. I mean, there is no buy-in from from the, the public. They don't have any ability to change the rules, um, unless you are in government or in the bureaucracy yourself. You're you're kind of subject to the rules. The rule, rules are not made in your interests, and you have no way to influence the decision-making process. And I think the the upshot of that is that people kind of then spend a, a whole lot of uh, energy in getting around the rules. And I think that's because, in some ways, that you know the uh, that, that sometimes there is a, a conflict between what is asked of people politically um, and what the rules are demanding of them, demanding uh, demanding of them. And so this is kind of when you kind of, you know, you just brought up the expression, but, you know, below there is policy and above there is policy and below there are ways that we implement policy. I mean, that really uh, speaks to the behaviour of local government officials. Um, you know, they, that they might have rules imposed on them which sort of restrict them from, behave, you know, d- doing something or other, but then there might be an overarching you know, political incentive to drive economic growth or mm. to see something or other done. And so people will get around the rules in order to be able to realise some other political incentive. So, uh, yeah, I, I think, I mean, that is kind of basically how the, the system works at the moment. I think it would take some really fundamental changes for, for that sort of behaviour to change. Mm. One, one thing that seems to be really core to your book is that people do these things with a faith that, that Beijing in the end can back them up if they're taking risk if they're taking debt that beijing doesn't want to see anybody fail and that that's that's a strength because people can take risk but at the same time it's it's their achilles heel it's something that can hold them back because people take all this risk and it catches up with them do you do you see since you wrote the book even has there been sort of a shift in how how that risk is playing out or are people still holding that kind of confidence no, it's, that's a really interesting question because I think this is perhaps the thing that has changed the most since I wrote the book. Okay. Now, it's it's not that people don't have the confidence anymore. It's just that the government has started to try and rein in the risk, right? So, you know, to, to back up a, a second, you know, the, the China's financial system works a little bit different from our own in the sense that in broadly speaking in in sort of the western financial system every financial institution sort of lives and dies um based on the faith that its customers and other financial institutions that it does business with the faith that they have that this company is in good shape this financial institution is in good shape and will continue to be a going concern and that's ultimately why lehman brothers collapsed because there was this growing sense that all oh, the quality of its assets aren't that good anymore. We're not sure if it's got enough money on hand for it to pay off its debts in the morning. So even if it's not, even if it is able to pay off its debts, it's not a risk that I'm worth, I'm willing to to take. And so I'm not going to lend money to it anymore. And that then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. As everybody loses faith in any given institution, it sort of, it, you end up with a, effectively a run and it collapses. Now, in China's system, it works differently because the 
the success or the viability of any given financial institution doesn't really rest on the quality of that institution. It doesn't rest on the quality of its assets or its the, the, you know, the cash it has on hand or the quality of its management. What it really rests on is the public's faith that the Chinese government will not let any given financial institution fail. And so what keeps the system aloft is faith in the government's overarching commitment to stability, to financial stability above all, all else. And so you have a lot of badly managed financial institutions, but you know they're still relatively safe because there is this broad awareness that they will not be allowed to fail. And so that kind of supports the entire system. And it really, on one level, it's great because it makes the system less risky. But as you were saying, it then creates a situation where um, people are willing to make more and more risky decisions. And that's really why you saw this massive expansion in lending since 2008 and this massive expansion in shadow banking and kind of more and more risky behavior because people could do it in the knowledge that ultimately the government is going to backstop everything. Now, what's changed over the last couple of years is not that people don't believe that the government doesn't backstop the system anymore. I mean, that commitment to financial stability is as strong as it has ever been. Mm. What has hap- what has changed is the political incentives. So let me put it this way. You know, the, the reason shadow banking exists in, in China is because the way that the government would try and rein in risk, it would tell the banks, okay, you're lending too much money, um, but our real issue is that you're lending to some parts of the economy that you shouldn't. So we don't want you to lend as much to property developers anymore. We don't want you to lend to local governments because they're building too much infrastructure. And we don't want you to build lend to heavy industry because they've already bought, built too many steel factories and shipbuilding you know, docks. No more credit to them. That's what's going to happen. And so this is where shadow banking came in, sort of evolved as a way for banks to continue lending to those sorts of parts of the economy, but in a disguised form. And so you'd have credit flowing to these parts of the the economy that the the regulators didn't want credit going to anymore through these nascent institutions of shadow banking. And so you had this situation where, for all intents and purposes, the government lost control of the financial system, that it would time and time again impose new regulations on the system to try and rein in risk and credit creation, and the system itself would immediately innovate around it. Sort of in cooperation between the banks and the shadow banks, they they innovate around these rules. And so what you had is a situation where the financial system would hew to the letter of the law. They would abide by the regulations of what they were being asked to do, but they would flout the spirit. (laughs) Now, what happened two years ago is the political dynamic of that completely switched, such that now the financial institutions... Uh, regardless of what the letter of the law asks uh, asks them to do, they are now very, very sensitive and in tune to the spirit of what the senior political leaders are asking them to do. And what fundamentally changed was Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign, which he launched in 2012. It gathered sufficient momentum that by the end of 2016, the cost, the political cost as an official of not complying with what was being asked of you, the spirit of what was being asked of you by senior leaders and Xi Jinping in particular, the political cost of not doing that was so high that it just wasn't worth innovating around the rules of the financial system anymore. And so that's really why you've seen you've seen change over the last couple of years is that you know you, the government has managed to affect a contraction in shadow banking. You haven't seen the sort of really creative financial innovation that we saw a few years ago. I mean, in 2016, you have the Chinese press writing about um, certain financial investments, products that were so um, complex in the way they were designed, that they were being described as rushing nesting, Russian nesting dolls. <laughs> that it, there was no way of actually knowing what was at the very center of these investments because they were so complicated. Now, that sort of stuff isn't happening anymore because the political equation has changed. And so this is the way you change the system. It is by sort of coming down hard from the very top of the system, not to change the, you know, not to change the you know, the, the sort of the, the uh, you know, th- this basic situation where the, um, the, the government's willing to ensure stability at all costs, that still exists. Rather, it is a change in the political incentives. Now, that's been great 
draining in financial risk and trying to bring some of this under control. But there's other problems here as well. So even as there's probably less risk in the system, the thing that the government is really worried about at the moment is the private sector that the private sector just isn't getting enough credit for all sorts of reasons. And so they keep hammering the banks, at least for the last six months, lend more to the private sector. Mm. But the private sector is perhaps the most risky part of the Chinese economy to lend to. It's easy to lend to state-owned enterprises because they've got, you know, they're backed by a whole lot of assets and they're backed by implicit guarantees from the government. But you've lent to a private company and you're kind of out there on your own. And so there isn't really, on one hand, the banks are being told, less risk, be more safe. On the other, they're being told, we need you to lend to the most risky part of the economy. And so this sort of change in the political dynamic is great to be able to stop the banks from behaving in a certain way. Now, it's far more difficult to actually get them to use that same dynamic to push them to proactively start behaving in new ways, particularly when there is sort of these real mixed messages coming down. So, yeah, the last couple of years have been fascinating. I'd say that's the single biggest thing that has changed since the, the, the book came out. Um, and it's still a bit of an open question as to how this is going to play out. Yeah. So with, with your, your perspective and, and these updates, what advice would you have for, for people who are investing their money and, and their money is, is mixed in with, with lots of things that are, that are going to be related to China? Would you say pull out, keep pushing into it? Where do you see investors working around this question of, of Chinese debt? Oh, um, you know, it's a tricky one for a, a lot of reasons. And the first one is because the Chinese have an incredibly good track record of drawing things out and maintaining stability mm -hmm. far longer than anyone would have anticipated. And, you know, as I just sort of laid out then, they've done an incredible job over the last couple of years dealing with financial risk. Now, the upshot of that is that we're seeing slower and slower economic growth. Um, but it does seem that, you know, we can probably avoid something that would look like an outright crisis. The question is, though, I'm less confident that we can avoid slower and slower growth. Now, the other side of the equation is that, well, China is a nation of 1.4 billion people. The authorities are pouring a whole lot of money into certain industries, particularly those that um, in more technologically advanced industries, like, as I mentioned before, you know, semiconductors, robotics, electric vehicles, but also, also things like, uh, you know, material sciences and um, agricultural equipment. Um, there's a long list of industries that are real government priorities, um, artificial intelligence as well. Yeah. So I think we're already, even if the economy as a whole is slowing, I think for investors in particular, there's, you, you really increasingly are going to have to segment exactly what you're looking at. So, sure, the economy is growing at a slow, uh, as a whole, but some parts of the country are far worse off than others. I mean, I, it wouldn't surprise me if the north, three northeastern provinces, Liaoning, Jilin, Heilongjiang, have probably already gone into recession. Tianjin. Um, the city of Tianjin is probably in terrible shape as well. Some other provinces seem to be only being held up by an incredibly fast expansion in infrastructure um, investment, which is, I think is uh, Guizhou in particular is like that. And then the same goes for specific industries as well, particularly those companies that are getting a lot of government support. You can probably see a lot of really interesting um um, opportunities in those industries in, in, in the future. Um, you know, the potential for some companies to really emerge as global giants. I mean, we're already seeing that already with, with some Chinese brands as well. I mean, your mm. Huawei's and ZTE's. So I think the thing to watch in the future is that it's not going to be enough anymore to kind of sort of say, is China, you know, is China slowing? Is it stimulating? In the past, that was that question you know, was in some ways enough because if China was growing more quickly and if it was stimulating, that would have a direct impact on demand for gold. It would have a direct impact on demand for iron ore. By uh, extension, it would affect the commodity currencies like, you know, like the Canadian and Australian dollars. Um, and so, you know, whether whether China was up or down had was kind of enough. But increasingly, um, I think it's, it's more, you know, we, we're going to, that the, the sort of the, it'll be more important to sort of break down China into its constituent parts. And I think one of the reasons is for that is because China is starting to let more and more foreign money actually flow into the Chinese stock markets and bond markets. So more foreign investors will be exposed directly 
to Chinese stocks and bonds, and hence, you know, by extension, that sort of more micro understanding is going to become more important. So I know that is a terrible answer for what you were looking for, <laughs> um, but increasingly my sense is that, uh, you know, it, it is difficult to give a straight up answer about what it means for in, investors anymore because I, I think it's it's becoming a lot much more of a complex um, a complex um, landscape. Well, I think I think that unto itself is a, is a valuable insight, though, that it's it's not just betting on China anymore. Like you said, to to segment and to, and to give it a little more thought, and that's that's huge. So I, I value that insight a lot. And uh, and for more more insights, if people want to find you online, where should people look for you? Um, well, these days I write a monthly newsletter called The Cleanup, which is focused specifically on what's being done to clean up China's financial system. Um, and you can sign up to that um, at www.dinnymcmahononeword.com. Um, and that newsletter I write for uh, I write at Macro Polo, which is a think tank attached to the Paulson Institute in Chicago. So uh, again, the, the newsletter is called uh, The Cleanup, and you can find that on my personal website, which is just my name. Excellent. All right, Denny. My my final question is, how can an outsider come to better understand China? What tips would you have? <laughs> You know, it really comes down to what you're trying to understand. Um, I, I think, for me, the most important entree into understanding China was always the language, and it still is today. I mean, there is so much about the way Chinese people think, how they look at the world, how they understand history and culture. It's, it's all tied up in the language. But clearly, for most people, that's not really a, an option. I actually think that, um, you know, there are plenty of fantastic books out there written by um, foreigners in particular who spend a lot of a, a lot of time in, in China um, and a lot of uh, ex-journalists as, as well. Uh, I think still to this day, one of my favorite books um, was uh, The Party by Richard McGregor. Um, uh, I'd say the, the the last book on sort of the the, the, the book before mine uh, that gave a, a fantastic sense of the Chinese state of the Chinese economy about a decade ago was when China shape, um, shapes the world by James King. Um, there's the Age of Ambition by Evan Osnos. Um, you know, I, I, they're all books by journalists, um, and I I've as somebody who's lived in China for a long time as a journalist myself, I always find that I do get an incredible amount of value from a lot of the China books that are written by long-term foreign correspondents um, after they leave China. Yes. And I would include yours among that. I will uh, I'll put a link to it in the description for, for anyone who's interested in picking it up, and I would uh, certainly give it a personal recommendation. Denny, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks very much, Brendan. It's been great talking to you. Everybody, that was Denny McMahon. He is fluent in Mandarin Chinese. He covered the Chinese economy for the Wall Street Journal, and he's the author of China's Great Wall of Debt, Shadow Banks, Ghost Cities, Massive Loans, and the End of the Chinese Miracle. And if you want to help us get more great guests like this on the show, then be sure to subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.